just what you have to do when a queen decides she's going to pop in to see you. And not just any old queen, Victoria. Like a pair of obsessed Victoria groupies, we're pursuing her around the country to the posh pads she visited. We'll be delving into her personal diaries and first-hand accounts to reveal what happened behind closed doors. Today we're in picturesque Yorkshire as we continue to follow the early progress of the young Victoria around the country. We're at Harwood House, where we're going to be finding out what happened to the young princess when she came to visit in 1835. And as someone who spent a lifetime getting excited by antiques, I'll be upstairs exploring just what would have excited Victoria on her visit here. Maybe Victoria used this very writing set when inscribing her diary. And as a chef who's passionate about great food, I'll be creating a spectacular Victorian asparagus dish. This is beautiful! This is going to be absolutely magical! Which will need a delicate touch. Do you know, I just don't feel I can disturb the arrangement. Victoria stayed at splendid Harwood House for three days when she was just 16 years of age. It was all part of her mother's master plan to secure her position in the monarchy and also make sure that she was viewed by the people favourably. This trip was made two years before she became queen, although she discovered she was to inherit the throne four years earlier but I can't wait to find out how this family greeted the royal party. So I'm heading off upstairs. So I'm heading downstairs to find out more. Good for you. The Queen travelled to Harwood by carriage. The Times reported that she left Bishop's Thorpe on Saturday morning a little after 10 o'clock and arrived three hours later accompanied by her mother, the Duchess of Kent. Victoria had been at the Yorkshire Music Festival before coming on to this beautiful house, and at the festival she had had an extraordinary reception. When she got here, she was greeted and escorted by the Yorkshire Hussars, who then would have formed up on this front lawn, and she then ascended these gracious steps and was ushered into the baronial hall, where she wouldn't have seen this rather risque statue which didn't arrive until the 20th century. Thank goodness. While Victoria was marvelling at the grand hallway, the servants who travelled with her were making a more low-key arrival. The staff at Harwood House would never be allowed through the main entrance. They would have come to the bowels along here of the house. Now, these storage rooms, they're huge. They would have kept coal in one, wood in another. It's enormous. But nothing compared to the size of the kitchen where I'm meeting our food historian, Ivan Day. I absolutely love this kitchen and the vaulted ceiling, which looks just like a church. The comparison with the church ceiling is really appropriate because the architect who designed it, John Carr of York, actually modelled it on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Wow. There aren't any frescoes up there, but the basic idea is that you have a stone vault which acts as a fire break. So if ever a fire broke out here, the rooms upstairs would be protected to a degree. So that's the purpose of the stone vaulting. But what's extraordinary about it is that this is an 18th century kitchen space. And that is the kitchen that would have cooked the food when Princess Victoria came here. There's one unique feature in this kitchen, which I think is wonderful, which is up there. It's a window. Yes. Um, and behind that is the chef's bedroom. So he could always keep his eye on what was going on in here. Absolutely fascinating. So what are we going to be making today? We do not have a menu for Princess Victoria's dinner that she had here at all. But at that time, in the 1830s, there are lots of references to putting asparagus on the table in the form of a pyramid. And I've hunted through Victorian cookery literature, and amazingly, I found a recipe that was probably written by a chef who worked here, a man called Louis Lecomte. He would have been the man who stared from that window. We start by making an unusual pastry for the crust. We're going to make a dish called asparagus in a crust. We've got eight ounces of plain flour. Right. 
And in here, I've got eight yolks. So there's one yolk for each ounce of flour. Oh, OK. Well, that's going to be a very hard pastry. It has to be. And it was made very much more for decorative purposes than for edibility, but you can eat it. OK. We're going to put most of the eggs in, and what I want you to do is to massage those into the flour. And, as you said, it will make quite a tough pastry. Mm, it will. But it will make something that we can actually get to stand up in the oven without collapsing. While we fold in the eggs and flour to our pastry dough, Tim's upstairs in search of some valuable artwork. This room today is known as the library, and it's exactly as it was when Victoria visited in 1835. At least in terms of the magnificent semi-barreled ceiling with its plasterwork by Robert Adam. And the fireplaces opposing at either end with their overmantels. The only major difference is, of course, all this magnificent mahogany case furniture for the storage of books. Victoria certainly would have seen these paintings by J.W.M. Turner. Turner, when he was 20 years of age, visited Harwood in 1797 and created this masterpiece in watercolour. Can you believe a 22-year-old being able to produce quite such a beautiful image? And, I mean, it's topographically correct. It shows the house sitting in Capability Brown's landscaped park with the artificially created lake down below. But if you look closely, here on the south side, the park, the Jardin Anglaise, literally approaches practically the wall of the house with sheep that could almost have walked in. Just look how very different it is today. Come on, look at that. This is the park as Victoria would have seen it and as completed by Capability Brown in 1772. But the changes have happened down below. Entirely along this south front has been constructed a most complicated and beautiful parterre. This was commissioned in the 1840s, just a few years after Victoria's visit. But what I think so extraordinary is the sheep are still there in the park on the other side of the parterre, whereas they would have been at her time right up to this wall itself. Beautiful, though, isn't it? Downstairs, we're working on our Victorian asparagus crust. The pastry dough's been made, rolled and cut into a long, narrow strip, then dusted with flour. We're going to form that into a little pie crust. We need this thing. It's called a cylinder mould. If I just pick that up and I wrap it around that, tiny bit of water, yes. just a little bit on that cheek there, we're going to stick the two pieces of pastry together. You're okay. keeping it quite loose, aren't you? It has to be, because I've got to get this off, you see. Now, here, look at this. This is a border mould. Look, the flowers and the leaves. It's beautiful. What we're going to do with this is to push some of the same pastry mm -hmm. into that. We've got to get it into that very deep part by pushing it down into there with your finger, you see. I'm going to turn it round and you can finish it off. Oh, right. So if I swing it round for you, if you could do that... I'll follow up behind you. Start right. at this end, start there. Oh, start there. Yeah. It's getting that deep bit. Thing. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm thinking. This is the tricky bit. We start off by trimming off the excess... Oh, can I try that? ..with the knife to keep it right flat against the wood. And you're going to go all the way down to the end. What we have now is the mould filled with the, the pastry. And it's best to push it so that you get this little gap. Now, this is the really difficult bit. The, the trick was to, to tap the mould on the board. And that releases it, we hope. We have to make a start. It is a bit wet, this pastry. Right, we've got it started. Right. Now, very, very gently, very gently... Beautiful. I just gently pull it out. Okay. And look oh, at... That the, is just stunning! Look, swap round with me, Rosemary. 
We're just going to wet it with some water. Mm -hmm. And then with a little bit of care, we're going to apply that to our base by just gently tapping it in. If you push it too hard, you'll spoil the definition of the flowers. Mm -hmm. I think that is stunningly beautiful. There is one final thing we're going to do yes. with it. Have you ever seen one of these before? No, I haven't, but it looks a bit like a stamp and a ravioli cutter. Well, I, it's, the English name is a jagger. And can you see it's got these little stamps on it? Yes. We're going to use this one, which is rather like the flower on mm -hmm. there, yep. to finish the top of our crust. So what we do is we push it in like that and twist the mould so it doesn't stick. Push um, it. Can I try? Line it up with that one and twist the mould. That is absolutely beautiful. We're now going to put our mould into a cool oven for two hours before we add the asparagus. This cosy room is the Spanish Library. It used to be part of the state apartments, but when the 16-year-old Victoria was here, it was her bedroom. It meant that she could stay close to her mother, the Duchess of Kent, who was in the room next door. Gosh, this is lovely, isn't it? Yes, it is indeed. Today, some of the fascinating objects in the room relate to Queen Victoria having been passed down to Victoria's great-granddaughter, Princess Mary, who married into the family here. And there's one particularly wonderful personal object, as the head of House and Collections, Anna Robinson, explains. This is actually a travelling writing set that belonged to Queen Victoria. It actually dates from 1816, although it was given to Queen Victoria, we think, in about 1861. You'll see here it actually fits rather nicely together, so mm -hmm. the top and top again, and it has an, an inkwell in the top here. Yes. And then obviously all of the implements and here an inkstand, and if you just screw it, if it's all very neat, you'll see here the rest of the implements. So a very beautiful piece. Incredibly practical, isn't it? Is that Queen Victoria's cipher that we see there? Yes, indeed. You'll see here it says the R for Queen Victoria, which is a really lovely addition to yeah. it. I tell you what I think is gorgeous about it, is you've got the original leather outer case. On the top of the outer case, we've got the cipher impressed into the leather. Mm. And it's all complete with these silver fittings. It's so practical, isn't it? Yes, it is. I mean, here we have poor Victoria being carted around the nation, having to carry all her possessions with her. I know she didn't have this with her when she came to Howard House, but all her other visits around the country for the rest of her reign and indeed abroad, she would have needed to take things exactly like this with her. Yes, indeed, travelling implements, travelling cases were often used by, um, by people like Queen Victoria. Yeah, and, but rarely of this quality, which is lovely. And who knows, after 1860, maybe Victoria used this very writing set when inscribing her diary. She could have used that pen, which yes. is charming. One fascinating room that would have been important during Victoria's visit is still here today. Though you certainly wouldn't have found the Queen down here. What is this room, Ivan? This, this is the still room and it's scullery, the still room scullery. These rooms started back in the 17th century and their prime purpose was actually to distill alcoholic waters, perfumes, medicines from products of the kitchen garden, the flower garden, and the orchards. Mm. Using a piece of equipment like this, this is actually the head of a still, there's a bit missing from it. This was used for steeping things like herbs in wine and leaving them to sort of just get all of the essential oils and flavors into the alcohol, and then putting it into the base of this, the little furnace underneath it, mm which slowly heated the alcohol, which evaporated, taking the oils and the flavours with it, and it drips out of the end and you get a very concentrated alcoholic water, originally used as medicine, and yes. then later on they became social drinks. So gin, which is juniper water, started yes. off as a medicine for epilepsy, and then it becomes a social drink. This wasn't just used for distilling waters, there were other products from the garden, like the fruit and the vegetables that were often preserved here. And this little stove that you can see is a wonderful thing because these are very, very rare. This is a drying stove and it's used for making fruit candies. 
So things like lemon peel, orange peel were soaked in syrups. Yes. And then they'd be put in here and slowly you'd dry them out to make candied peels. Around the time Victoria visited here, the role of the still room changed as they started to make preserves and pickles as well. Pickling and preserving did two things. They were saving money for the house because they were doing it when it was cheap and it was in abundance and they had food available all through the year which was really important because you can just take things off the shelf and, and enjoy your peaches mid-winter. On a large estate like this you've got orchards, kitchen gardens, mm. herb garden and they're set up basically to produce enough material to feed what is a sizable community. It's not just the family, it's not the Earl and his family. You've got all the servants, the estate workers. Yes. So these are little mini factories, really, producing food from the raw products from the estate for storing over winter. Everything from pickled onions to pickled eggs to yes. gooseberry jam and marmalades, mm -hmm. all those things. One thing that's very interesting is that during the 19th century you get this huge expansion in trade and empire and it was things like chutneys that really start to become very fashionable because of the connections with India and the Raj. And a lot of the cookery books are full of recipes for chutneys yes. and things called catsups and ketchups. Yes. And those, are the, those bottled sauces and things were first of all made in these places and then of course with the expansion of industrialised food in the second half of the 19th century, they start making them in factories. Mm. And often what happened here is a lot of these things start to be bought in because the factories can make them more cheaply. And the role of the still room maid and the housekeeper starts to dwindle a little bit by the end of the 19th century. And after the First World War, these places become extinct. Not far from the still room is the servants' hall where all the staff would have gathered for their meals. These hooks would have been used for the footman's uniforms and as with many stately homes, there was also an elaborate bell system to make sure they were permanently at the beck and call of the guests upstairs, including Victoria. We know that the Queen brought many of her own staff from London for this trip judging by the report in the London Morning Post, which said, Harwood Hall, magnificent doings are expected in the course of a few days. Cooks and confectioners and upholsterers left town yesterday. Despite the upstairs-downstairs system of the day, there was one place where everyone came together. The local community, Toffs, servants and village folk all attended the local church on the Harwood estate. Victoria walked to church that sunny September Sunday in 1835, observed by literally thousands of people. On her arm was her mother, the Duchess and the Earl, and on her other side was her friend, Lady Georgina Harcourt. It wasn't altogether a pleasant experience, though, for Victoria. She writes in her diary, It was immensely hot in church, and I felt uncomfortable. I could not go to luncheon, but had some broth in my own room. What she didn't realise at the time was that there had been a right royal row brewing about this whole service long before she arrived at Harwood. She should have been listening to a sermon from the local vicar, Reverend Hale, but instead she got words of wisdom from the archbishop himself, who had been invited by her host, because it was felt that a sermon preached by the local vicar might have been offensive to her young and tender ears. Not surprisingly, the local vicar was furious and wrote to the press. Oh, lordy. It would seem that the Earl and the Archbishop went to extraordinary lengths to prevent Reverend Hale giving his sermon. <laughs> Goodness only knows what they thought he might have said. As it happens, Princess Victoria was well aware as to how to conduct herself on the Sabbath because in her journal she records that that afternoon she wrote a letter to my sister, saw the children again, wrote some things in my journal read a lecture in the exposition of St. Matthew's Gospel. Good girl. 
After church, the servants would have been straight back on duty, just like us today. The pastry for our Victorian asparagus in a crust is out of the oven, ready for the filling. This Victorian recipe calls for a copper pan to boil the asparagus. The copper causes a chemical reaction that makes them even greener. It's completely harmless, but shows how much thought the Victorians put into creating the perfect looking dish. Once boiled, our extra green greens are drained and laid out ready for the assembly job, which as ever in posh Victorian cooking is very fiddly. We're going to start with these very short ones. Right. And you rest them against the side. They have a tendency to fall over, so, so try and lean, really, it, lean really it against careful. the side. So we've got four layers, four tiers, if you like. You've got to be very careful with a delicate touch. It's very tricky. It's much easier when we get yes. the bigger ones in the middle, exactly. but this is the difficult one and the next one. I love doing this. They must have had a lot of people in the kitchen to be doing this sort of thing. So when would this have been served, Ivan? This was served in a course at, towards the end of the meal, okay. which was called the entremet course. And although it's a vegetable dish, it was served at the same time that jellies and ices really? and other puddings were, yes. Good Lord! Get them nice and upright. Right. That's it. This is beautiful! This is going to be absolutely magical. But you've got to have a lot of asparagus. And even more patience. To finish off, it's a different technique altogether. The tall ones, not all of them, because I've got a few spare, mm -hmm. and we make sure that they're absolutely Perfect. like that, and then I drop Perfect. them in. Then we finish off by gently pushing Just the others pushing them in. in. Yeah, a few more on this side, and then we can then fluff the whole thing up. Mm. And there we have it. Mm. Asparagus in a crust. I think that is... Fabulous. I just love it, love it, love it. I can't wait to take it to Tim. I really can't. And I can't wait to try it. Now, we know Victoria became quite an arts lover in later years, but she also liked to tinkle the ivories and was actually taking piano lessons around the time of this visit, although it appears she wasn't very keen on taking instructions. Here in the music room, I'm meeting Irene Truman, the house steward at Harwood and also a classical pianist. She has a revealing story that shows our 16-year-old Princess Victoria could be quite a diva with her piano teacher, one Mr Sale. Apparently he didn't get on with her terribly well. He was obviously not very influential or inspirational for her. It is known that Mr Sale became quite impatient with her at one point and said, you must practice more like everybody else. At this point, she lost her temper, slammed the piano lid down and said, there's no must in it. <laughs> and that was the end of the lesson. <laughs> Making it perfectly clear who's yes, the boss. Yes, absolutely. Victoria's passion for music continued throughout her life. She also had another love, food. And that love most probably began around the time of this visit in magnificent rooms like this, where she started to become accustomed to incredibly grand dinners. And this is the gallery where Princess Victoria dined. It's no surprise that they're able to cram in quite so many guests into this space because it's 76 feet long, 24 feet wide and 21 foot high. As royal dinners go, this was right up there. Victoria ate with 130 distinguished guests. Cool, imagine that. She said she thought the room was beautiful and recorded that she had her dinner just after 6 p.m. And like any teenager might, rather sweetly, she was allowed to stay up until nearly 20 past nine. Well, luckily for me, I'm not catering for 130 guests. Instead, I've set up a table for two at the end of the gallery for our own private banquet. <laughs> Hello! Rosemary, this is good timing, well, isn't it? Well, it certainly is. Now, okay. I had to bring this in before because I was a bit worried about this dish because it's very, very valuable. This is called asparagus in a pastry crust. Look how ornate it is. This was served at the end of the meal with the jellies and desserts was and things really? like... Yes, because some people wanted savoury. 
do tuck in and take a little bit of mayonnaise and have it with your fingers. Now, this mayonnaise has been especially prepared, has it? Yes, it yeah. certainly has. It's a good colour. Do you know, I just don't feel I can disturb the arrangement. You have to go first. So I just take one from there. Do you? Just, just the one? Just, just take one or two. There we but, go. Oh, then that's got it. Lovely. And then we mix it in there. Mm. Mm. Delicious. They are not overcooked, are they? But I love them like that. So Victorian, hours to create, but a lot quicker to consume. Mmm, delicious. I want to show you a little something, which is really special. This little box, what does that say? HRH, the Princess Victoria's watch. And is if that... I pop it open, what's it got inside? Was that her watch? It definitely was. <gasps> no. And I'm going to open it up very, very carefully. Look at that. Deep, deep oh. royal blue enamelling on the back. And then you've got this lovely scrolly type stuff, which is called an arabesque. But if you look very carefully, in the middle of that fine gold work is her initial V. I can see that, yes. Can I just hold it for you one can. second? They're called open-faced cylinder key-wound watches. And that's the sort of watch that you'd expect to find in a top quality jewellers or watchmakers in the 1820s or 1830s. But if I press that on the end, it springs open and inside you can see the hallmark for 18 karat gold and then a very fine little inscription which says, to my dearest child on the 24th of May, 1830, from her affectionate and devoted mother, Victoria. So the Duchess of Kent was called Victoria and on the child's 11th birthday, she presented her with this little gold watch. How did they get it here? As a result of the royal connections between the Harwood family and the royal family, it would have come to the Princess Royal, and that's why this is a treasured possession at Harwood House to this very day. Now, I was very taken by the story of how the Archbishop usurped the poor local vicar to give the church sermon during Victoria's visit. And to add insult to injury, I've discovered that Victoria mentions the Archbishop in glowing terms in her diary. She'd actually sat next to the Archbishop of York the night before in this very room Did she? for dinner. Yeah. Well, she clearly got on with him mm. because they'd spent a few days together beforehand. Exactly. She wrote in her diary... The Archbishop is an extraordinary person of his age. He is nearly 78 years old, has all his teeth, has a powerful voice and is extremely active and his mind is as perfect as any young man's. Gosh. Just like you, Tim. Hey. <laughs> Next time we catch up with Victoria, she's still a teenager and on a trip to Holcombe Hall in Norfolk to visit England's greatest commoner. And here, her music education continued as our royal teenager was introduced to karaoke, Victorian style.